All righty. Ray, mate, cheers for yeah. coming on again. Appreciate it a million. But um, yeah, come to do a deep dive on Japan's bubble. So your article I thought was specifically good about the political backdrop surrounding Japan's lost decade. So you don't come across that too often. Most of the time it's purely about the economics. But um, in the first place, what made you decide to write about it? Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, that was a journey and a half. Like, you know, it's one of those rabbit holes where you think you know what it is until you step inside it. And it's just the material, especially in Japanese, that's written about the bubble. It's, I mean, it could fill a whole library, to be honest. But I think like, just like probably you, most people have heard about the bubble. And most people have heard about this like crazy 80s Japan. But I don't think they understand the scope of like the insanity the bubble really was. and how it actually was one of the biggest bubbles in world history of any country. And so like living here, I just realized that everything that happens in Japan, in politics, economics, or even how people react, like it's all connected to this era, the bubble era, because it was so big for Japan. So, I mean, I feel like I couldn't continue a blog on Japanese business without digging deep into the Japanese bubble. Yeah, fair call. Good as reason as any. Um, and yeah, I'm trying to work backwards here, going through your LinkedIn to find your age, so work with me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, as you discussed in our previous podcast, you were born in rural Japan. And even though you grew up mostly in Sweden, you did attend elementary school in Japan. So I'm just curious about you and your experience. Um, so what were your first memories of Japan's bubble? And is there anything that sticks out either that happened to you, friends or family? Mm. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Uh, I think you probably did a pretty good detective job because yeah i was i was born in japan in kumamoto which is a, a quite a rural place for japanese standards and i was born right before the bubble burst and honestly like looking back i'm I'm pretty grateful that my parents didn't you know raise me in japan because here our generation we're really the unlucky ones you know i, I released an article yesterday about the lost generation they're a little bit older than me, but almost the same generation. And it's basically the people who grew up in, you know, a Japan where everyone's looking at the past for greatness. And that generation just got the worst end of the stick. You know, they got the aftermath. They didn't get the jobs they wanted, even though they studied harder than any other generation. And they just, you know, whenever they looked at the present or the future, everything just looked bleaker and bleaker, right? So... I think the memories I have from elementary school, even though, you know, they're, I was very young, so they're not super clear, but I still remember it just being like so tough. Like, you know, I went to Swedish school a little bit and then Japanese elementary school. And it's like, you know, it's like a, a work week, but you also work on Saturdays when you're seven years old. So you go <laughs> on school Monday to Saturday and just like cram any kind of information and you're always told even when you're that young that like you have to learn this or otherwise you will be like useless in society and Dang. i feel like that's that's kind of the group i grew up with you know like you have to be good enough just to be a part of japanese society Dang. and so yeah it's, it's it was quite a, a rough like start for japanese people and you know uh, as a half swede I think I got the much easier end. <laughs> yeah, <fair laughs> Without, enough. Uh, you know, yeah. That's tough. I feel like we're complete opposite in Australia. It's, yeah, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I think us, yeah, Swedes are definitely closer to Australians there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, with the article and talking about the build up of the bubble, um, so as you wrote, like Japan was on the verge of surpassing the United States as the world's largest economy, basking in the glow of seemingly endless prosperity. So, it's a hard task and a big one, but um, how did Japan get to this point in the first place of nearly surpassing the US? Wow, you're asking really big questions here. <laughs> but, uh, well, honestly, I think, I mean, first of all, this this question could fill a whole lot of podcasts. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to simplify a bit, right? Um, but like, you know, imagine... You're you're quite young, I think. I mean, me too, to be fair. Yeah, ninety six. I, I think so. we don't. It's hard to grasp. Yeah, exactly. So it's hard to grasp just how big Japan was, like how much on everyone's mind it was. But like, imagine in the eighties, right? Like today, we you know associate these you know Asia, we associate China, Taiwan, Korea, even India, right? It's like these 
you know, countries of incredible growth and, you know, where the, the growth engine comes. But in the 80s, it was only Japan. Japan stood for all of those things. So, you know, you say the world's factory, right? Today's China. Back then, it was only Japan. The world's most advanced technology, Japan. World's most efficient labor force, Japan. And the world's growth engine, right? Which we now attribute to India and China, also Japan. And I think, like, it, it wasn't even that far off, especially in the 60s and 70s. Like, you had companies like, you know, Canon or Honda or, you know, Toyota, who just destroyed the Western competitors. Like, I mean, I know your your colleague, your friend, Asian Omnitry, he talks a lot about Japanese semiconductors, right, in the 80s. And they were, they were truly the greatest. And Americans were just shocked that Japan had, like, taken that industry by storm out of nowhere. That was really Japan. They just came in and demolished the competition. And I think that held very true. And, and Japan was on a good trajectory, right? Up until the 80s. And so in the 80s, things kind of spiral out of control. Like there's many, many reasons for this. Uh, you know, you probably maybe heard about the Plaza Accord as like a, a big thing. People should Google it if they want to know more. But things like that made the Japanese government uh, deregulate banks a lot. And also the yen started appreciating at the time. So everything in Japan just naturally got valued higher, right? And as a result of these increased liquidity and just the super positive sediment that has been going on in Japan at that time for like 30, 40 years straight, right? It was just an uptick in stocks and property prices that accelerated enormously from previous decades. And, you know, in I think what's super interesting here is that with normal bubbles, you know, you see governments and central banks, hopefully, you know, trying to calm the market a bit uh, by increasing interest rates or raising taxes. But Japan, at this time, they were doing the opposite. And then you had Japanese companies flexing even more at that time. You know, like there's a good story of Toyota they made like 50-year um, forecasts and they started to publicly announce these 50-year forecasts of like how many cars they were going to sell in like 2020, basically, like right now. And at that time, because Japan was so confident and people that invested in Japan were so confident, like they believed it. So they were like, uh, GM, they do like five-year forecasts, right? While Toyota does 50-year forecasts, like of course they should be valued like 50 times more. And so they all these Japanese companies got valued into the heavens, right? And so I think you have, you know, you have foreign investors being super positive, Japanese investors being even more positive, and then the government cheering you on, like saying, like, you should be even more positive. We're going to make sure to make it even better. That just turned Japan into, like, the craziest bubble in history. And I mean, if you do you want to hear some statistics of how crazy it was, yes, I, I noticed yes. some down. I love it. Yes. <laughs> Hit me. So, so first, um, 13 of the 20 most valuable global corporations in 1989, right? At the peak of the Japanese bubble, they were Japanese. So more than half of the 20 largest companies in the whole world were Japanese. And then... On top of that, the, the asset bubble, so the property prices, you know, we talk about 2008 as this, you know, horrible time in the US, but in the early 90s, Japanese property prices were almost valued doubled of American property prices in 2008 in the largest cities. So the bubble was basically twice as big in Japan as 2008 US, which is just, it's unfathomable, right? Yeah. And is. It's like stories of um, I, I, one one fact I really love is that so you know Japan it's it's quite a small country especially if you're from Australia mm, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I read somewhere it's like the size of Australia uh, sorry of uh, California I think mm. Mm -hmm. and all the land in Japan was worth more than all the land in the U.S. at its peak. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> and just like the Imperial Palace, right? Mm. Just the Imperial Palace in Japan, which is like a couple of football fields big. You like you can literally walk around it in like an hour, half an hour. That place alone was worth more than California. <laughs> oh my god! So it's just uh, 
you, you don't understand. Like people were insane, right? Like yeah. when you say it out loud, you're like, this is how does it even work? But that's literally how crazy Japan was at the time. Yeah. And you even add to the fact of where they were 20, 30, 40 years prior to that, like the insane rise. It happened so quickly. Yeah. So It yeah. really, really did. Wow. What a time. That's one thing I wish I could have yeah, seen in real time because it just, I don't know. You wonder if you get swept up in the manic, the mania. You know what I mean? Like, is it, you start believing all the hype. I don't know. Crazy. But um, yeah, I mean, we see it time and time again, right? Yeah. This time it's different. That's always exactly. the number one rule. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So, um, yeah, do you want to talk a bit about the bubble popping? And as the bubble popped, things weren't looking good, obviously. But um, how did the Japanese government step in and what did they do? Oh, yeah. So the bubble popped around, you know, started around 91, trickled into 93, and it just got worse and worse, right? And the Japanese government, I mean, they could see the writing on the wall, but they're a very conservative government. And so they started with, you know, what, what governments do, right? They started to reduce income taxes a bit. They fired us on public works. And it might have worked if it wasn't the largest bubble in history, right? So it, it basically didn't do anything. Like these tiny, you know, like building a new tunnel or whatever in the middle of nowhere, like it was like putting a Band-Aid on an open wound. Like it was way too little and way too late. And so... When bankruptcy started piling up, the Japanese government uh, started realizing more and more how bad it really was, and they panicked a bit too. So they started bailing out companies and banks left and right, and they basically gave lifelines to any company or bank big enough or connected enough to have an impact on the Japanese economy. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's it's really hard to understand how much in trouble the government was. And I think, you know, of course they panicked because any government would, but they they really didn't have like a plan. They really didn't think the bubble was going to pop. Yeah. And even then, like you said, it's the biggest bubble in history. It's such a mess. What do you even do? So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so the government's in strife. You also, the one I found interesting was um, Japanese banks and the mess they were in. So billions in collateral, um, collateral, sorry, um, but then just not being able to collect it. So you want to talk about that and explain that? Oh yeah, I mean that's so that's quite common, right? And it was same in two thousand eight. You have all these banks uh, holding horrible loans, right? Mask that's better loans, and yeah, Japanese banks were also going haywire with this in the eighties. So you know, first of all, properties were as as you saw very expensive already, right? But there was these practices in many Japanese banks at the time, almost all Japanese banks, where they would, you know, prop up the value of companies and properties even more than they were valued in the bubble. So they could give out more loans and make their balance sheet look bigger, right? And, you know, of course, this is illegal. Like Japan is not a completely a country where you can do whatever you want. But it was it was really systematic in the end, you know. As as long as things went up, it's very easy to believe that, you know, you you overvalue something and hopefully the thing grow into the valuation and then boom, you're scot-free, right? You were just like ahead of the curve. But when the bubble started popping, it was really bad because all these banks were sitting on these horrible loans that they, they had to collect because a lot of companies were going bankrupt. And they couldn't, right? Because first of all, the loans were not nearly as valuable now after the bubble had popped. But then on top of that, they had overvalued the overvaluation so they were really screwed in that sense and then also you didn't have any whistleblowers in japan partly because you know japan is a very like you know everybody follows like you know the same way but also it was it was so systematic this problem that a lot of banks a lot sorry a lot of employees in banks were holding these loans personally so their personal wealth was connected to these horrible loans so there was no incentive for anybody to be a whistleblower because not only would you know they lose their reputation, but also they would lose all their money. And so banks really went hardcore in trying to, you know, get emergency loans from the government so they could give emergency loans to the companies that they were supporting. And so we got this weird situation where we got tons and tons of what we now call zombie corporations, which is basically... These companies have a huge debt burden. 
And the only reason they are still alive, even though they're very inefficient and poorly run, is because they get these cheap or free loans from banks that are in turn supported by the government. So this is how the situation was kept alive for a very long time. And why maybe you didn't see like the craziness of even 2008, the US, because the Japanese economy just like, as you know, it went like down like this. It never crashed. Mm. And this is the sole reason that the government was trying to keep everything alive as long as it could. Yeah. And using the Band-Aid analogy, sometimes you got to rip the Band-Aid off and yeah cause some damage yeah. and then repair it. But um, yeah, you've also written about zombie companies, which I'll be sure to link because that was a great article too. Um, but yeah, one piece Thank in you. your article was about the fiscal structural reform law. So um, why did that stunt Japan's recovery? And could you explain that? Oh, yeah. I actually, I didn't know about this um, until my mom told me about it, I think. Because... Nice. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I remember because I was in Japan at that time, actually. And um, it was like, so Japan had uh, a 0% VAT for the longest time. Um, so you basically paid nothing for any goods you bought. And I know in Australia, it's, I don't know how much, but it's like 15, 20%, maybe. Yeah, GST, um, Kempson, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, you know, uh, many names. But, mm. anyways, this in 97 they raised it to i think five percent and it was like this classic where you had to calculate it yourself so you bought something and then you would just like get more money on top <laughs> so it angered a lot of people at the time but this was a whole package um in 97 it was basically a new cabinet in the government and they were seeing you know how the you know unsustainable loaning practices had made the government deficit like sky high it rose from like 40% in the 80s to like over 100% in, in less than five years. So, you know, now 100% doesn't sound so bad for Japan because they're almost up to 300%. <laughs> but at that time, it was crazy, right? Mm. So the government panicked. They were like, we need to, you know, call the investors. And so they started with these tax packages. So basically, oh, we're going to restore the fiscal balance in no time, right? So raise healthcare prices, raise corporate taxes, raise the VAT or GST. And I mean, it, it was like the worst timing because the economy hadn't recovered at all. So all of a sudden, you have people who earn less money than they did five, seven years ago. And now they're taxed more heavily. And the same with corporations, right? So people stop buying more stuff because VAT is now more expensive. Mm. People have less income to spend. And corporations are starting to save more money because of the raised corporate taxes. So you went into like a double dip recession where the recession got even worse because of this tax reforms. Damn, what a mess. What a mess. Um, yeah. And- and yeah, so how intertwined were and are businesses and the Japanese government? So you gave a great example in the article of Long-Term Credit Bank of Japan and how they managed to stay afloat. But um, yeah, how and why did these sorts of situations occur? Oh, I mean, you, uh, <laughs> you talked to a lot of people in Asia. And I mean, they can all, all tell you that in Asia, governments and corporations often have quite cozy relationships. Uh, for better or worse, right? Mm. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, in, in the West, we, we like to, you know, point at like China and be like, oh, you know, Huawei is so corrupt, disgusting, right? But but to be honest, like, this is the reason why Asia has been able to grow, especially East Asia has been able to grow so fast. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, companies like TSMC, no way they would be able to exist without Jibbles. the help of the government. Yeah, yeah exactly, right? It's companies like Samsung, right? These companies would never exist without the help of the government. So I think it's very important first to lay out the groundworks that like having a closer relationship with the government is not necessarily a bad thing. It's often a pretty good thing. But if, you know, if times are tough, if things go badly for the company or if the company is badly run, I mean, it, it can go south very quickly, right? And so I, I like that you took up the LTCB, Uh, long-term credit bank because it is a very interesting example of like when you know the thing we fear in the west the close relationship with the government and companies when that is bad is really ltcb is a prime example so you have this bank 
it's it's actually quite a good bank to start with. It's it was it was always close to the government. So it was created by a former prime minister Shigeru Yoshida in 1952, I think. And it was basically a bank that was just going to help with you know industrializing Japan. So they would give out stable and long term loan to Japanese industries so they could grow, which is a, it's a, you know it's a beautiful thing, and every developing country needs it. And they were doing a very good job for a very long time. And therefore, they also got, you know, probably too cozy with the government. But still, they were they were going up slowly and surely until the 1980s, right? When um, all the banks in Japan went crazy with loaning out to everybody and anybody. And they had this, you know, like, we should be the stable bank. We should be the bank that is responsible, fiscally responsible. And it, I don't know, I haven't read too much into it, but there was some new leadership or some new people that wanted to push a new agenda. And they obviously saw what the other banks were making. So they went all in. So mm -hmm. they started buying up assets in Japan for crazy prices, but they didn't stop there. They started buying assets in Australia, you know, like assets in Sydney, New York, London, Singapore, anywhere they could get a hands, hands on over, overvalued assets, basically. <laughs> And it, it got so bad that they were in the late 80s, they were the ninth largest bank in terms of holding assets in the whole world. So we're talking now about a conservative, a bank that's usually called the long-term credit bank, right? a boring bank that's now the ninth largest bank in the world and probably holding the worst loans in Japan while being the bank that's str most strongly connected to the government. Yeah. And so you have this issue, right? And then on top of that, the, the you know politicians have asked for multiple favors from the bank. So there's you know there's many like for example the bullet train in Japan Shinkansen. There's routes that don't make any sense that were probably built because some politician wanted some votes from a municipality or whatever, right? Mm. You have a bunch of tunnels in nowhere that still exist, right? That still have to be maintained, also supported by LTCB. So all these crazy things just supported by this one bank, which is basically now not only having horrible assets abroad, but also helping the party to win with holding horrible assets inside Japan. And so when the crisis hits, the bank goes sideways very quickly, but it never defaults. And we don't know much what happens because, you know, the government still holds many documents in secret, and I haven't been able to find that much information. but. The truth is, it was kept alive by the government, and the prime minister at the time actually directly helped with selling off assets from the bank and splitting it up. Wow. And still, this, of course, because this probably was a lot of corruption involved, we don't know what the government did to be able to sell these assets, but any rational person would probably not buy them. So mm. we can only assume that the government did a lot of favors for a lot of people to be able to sell off these assets. And I think the last interesting part um, is just that, you know, in a very Japanese fashion, you might say, uh, nobody got convicted for anything. So no top executive was ever convicted. But there was still smear campaigns on media, right? There was a lot of angry people who lost a lot of money. And at the end, just months after the final um, court conviction or non-conviction, two executives actually uh, committed suicide. So it's very Japanese in the sense that, you know, the court of the people, the, the, yeah. you know, the walk of shame is so much stronger than the actual courts in the country. <laughs> wow, what a story. What? We need a movie about it. <laughs> well, at least a book, like there's long-term yeah, capital management and then long-term credit bank, just as good, if not better. Wow. Oh my god! I think yeah, Wolf of Wall Street has nothing on this one. <laughs> I know. Damn, we need this. Oh man. Okay, your opinion, Tom. How tough question too. So I'm sorry, but um, how would you rate or even judge <laughs> Japan's recovery? Oh wow. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll try my best. I mean, it, it is the million dollar question, I guess. Um, I think to be honest, um. I, I want to start on, on the positive notes, which I think is very forgotten. 
I mean, I hate reading, or hate is a strong word, but I dislike reading a lot of this, like uh, the Western storyline, I call it. Um, like there was an example, uh, sorry, it was, for example, an article in uh, BBC. Uh, um, this uh, Rupert guy, he's lived in Japan for many, many years, even though he doesn't speak any Japanese. I know the one, but... yeah. <laughs> yeah, you should probably link to it. Because it, it's, it's, it's like his last article, it got like, on the top 10 articles on BBC News. Mm. And it's basically him because he's leaving, BBC's leaving Japan, so I guess they made him a favor, right? And he wrote this like story of how he was living in Japan. And it's so annoying because he writes this like old, you know, tried and true tale, which people love to read about Japan, you know? It's like, oh, the country that was in the future, but now it's stuck in the past and everybody's old and dying and all the companies, they were great and now they're horrible. And nothing ever changes. And end of story, right? Like, Japan will just sail into the sunset and we will all forget Japan ever existed in, like, 10 years, right? And I just, that's, it's not true. Like, when you, when you live here, when you come here, you realize that actually Japan is is evolved a crazy amount since the 90s, you know? Like, first of all, just being in Tokyo or Osaka, wherever you go as a tourist, you can just see the difference, how Japan has changed and how much cleaner and more structured Japan is than ever before. But also like if you look on on you know a more round level, like on a more framework level, and like Japan's legal framework is immensely better. The government has really cleaned up a lot of things. And to be fair, I, I think in Asia, except for maybe Singapore, there's no other country that has a better or stronger legal framework. And it is really interesting that people don't know about this, that like Japan for finance people is the safest haven. That's where people want to put their money, right? When Hong Kong people can't invest in Hong Kong for whatever reason, they come to Singapore, yes, but also to Japan, no other country. And it's because Japan is now a really good country for business and a country that has really evolved. And also... Like Japan is still the world's third largest economy. Like that's that's not a small feat, you know. Like sure, China surpassed Japan like 15 years ago, but they have a billion plus people. And Japan has a shrinking population, right? So it's it's just like keeping this economical momentum going means that you have a good corporate base that produce a lot of good things year in and year out. And I mean, now it sounds super positive about Japan. And I think there are definitely some negative sides. Like, as I said, the government deficit is the highest in the world in percentage. And it's it's massive and it doesn't look like that's going to change anytime soon. And it's a lot of it is because these bad loaning practices I talked about before, they never really stopped. So Japan, yes, they let some companies go bankrupt. But especially since COVID, there's a lot of unproductive so-called zombie companies and zombie banks still alive and well in Japan. And it's something that the government will need to clear up one day because, I mean, it's unsustainable, right? These companies don't make any money, they don't pay any taxes, and they still get free stuff from the government. Mm. But I think, you know, whoever has to clean this up, his political career is over, right? Or hers. So it, it's, you know, it's one of those things like that Japan is so good at, at kicking the can down the road. And I think that's the negative I would put on Japan, that really has destroyed the image of Japan in many ways, and which I think is one of the biggest issues Japan has, and probably why you can write an article about how stagnant Japan is and be, you know, at least 40, 30% right and get away with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's on the BBC article. It's, it's, this is slightly off topic. It's strange how much of a magnet Japan is for just terrible takes. Like I saw one today on Twitter, some dude, and we got heaps of engagement, but some guy was like, oh, I've been to Japan and everyone was in a rush and didn't want to chat or like they're in a bubble. And some guy commented, oh, where'd you go? Oh, just to Tokyo. And it's like, no wonder if you go to a mega city, people are in a rush. Like people just paint it with such. Yeah. I mean, try to go to New York. (laughs) Exactly. I I was was like, I just don't even have words sometimes, but it's like, I don't know. It's the nature of the beast. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's also like, you know, people have, because of, of I mean, media's like portrayal of Japan, I think people have a fixed image of Japan and then they try to 
factor everything into that image, right? Yeah, yeah. It just and it's a lot of conflicting thoughts. Like, you know, people uh, always, they like, you know, Japan, they're Japanese people are so, you know, they, they don't like to take decisions or they're very like scared of, you know, thinking outside the box. But then you also have the wackiest and craziest stuff all coming from Japan. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, how does that make sense, right? And yeah. I feel like there's a lot of these uh, paradoxes mm-hmm. that people have a hard time with. Like when they read an article, like, you know, Japan is stagnant, nothing changes. And then they go to like the Team Lab exhibition. I don't know if you've been there, but it's yep. one of the coolest like art exhibitions in the world. It was in Daiba, like, is it? In? Oh yeah, it's in, in Odaiba. And, yeah. And they have a Mori Art Museum too now. Oh damn, haven't been that one, no. And I just, right? And it, it's just like, it's the, these paradoxes exist because a lot of the things we think about Japan are simply not true, right? Mm. And so I hope that I can get the message out with a lot of other people, obviously, that, you know, Japan is very different from what most people believe. Yeah. So that's one thing. Um, I don't know if you know, I did an episode with Unseen Japan guys, and that's one bit they really hit on and passionate about too, which I totally agree with. But it's like, if I notice it and I'm not mm. from Japan or I don't speak the language, I notice how bad some of the takes are. I imagine how painful it is for you guys to see it every day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the worst thing is when people who's been here for a week uh, wants to tell you why Japan, like how to fix Japan. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, that's that's painful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just another Sunday. <laughs> oh. Yeah, exactly. Um, so overall, is there anything we haven't talked about today or missed about Japan's bubble? Anything else you want to cover? Um, I mean... Now, when the borders are open, you should come here. <laughs> yep. Very nice Very to meet cool. you for once. Yes. But, but also, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Perfect. Uh, yeah, we should totally go skiing or something. Yes. But uh, I think, that, I mean, that goes out to all your listeners and all your viewers that, I mean, you should come here to see Japan uh, to get your own opinion about it. Because I think, you know, part of Japan is conservative and Japan has issues. but when you come here, you really see the amazingness Japan has to offer, both in terms of the economy and food and views and people. And I just think that it's it's really gives you the idea that Japan is a very prospering country with a lot of potential. And I, to be honest, I've had many people come here, uh, both friends and acquaintances. And so far, I don't know a single person has been disappointed by their trip to japan at least they haven't told me <laughs> <laughs> no man i echo your friend's sentiments it's oh yeah it's so good there's and that's the thing there's something for everyone there's the food there's the culture there's the snow like snow there's yeah it's got everything you need so i love it i cannot mm. rave about it highly enough so yeah love it um in terms of japan's bubble has there been any books or other content anything else you want to highlight or link to or that's been influential um, you think we should mm-hmm. check out? Uh, I mean, so I read uh, also for my Japanese practice. I did a Japanese book about the crisis. Oh, I uh, sadly don't remember its name, <laughs> but um... you can send it later. I'll link it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, on Cody Travel, you, you can always find my sources. Mm-hmm. But um, for your English listeners, um, I really recommend uh, the Princes of the Yen. It's, it's quite a controversial book about the topic of how actually America and, and Japan's like, um, you know, uh, move towards liberal, the liberal markets. It's a big part of why the economy never recovered. Hmm. And I also recommend David Pilling's uh, Bending Adversity. I think that's one of the most famous books about the uh, bubble and the, the aftermath uh, because he, he was a Financial Times reporter here and, uh, you know, uh, in um, contrast to Rupert Wingfield, which is the BBC reporter, he actually speaks Japanese. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so he understands Japan. And yeah. you can really see it in his book. Like mm. he really writes about Japan in a way that I can relate to as a half Japanese person. Mm. And so I think that's one of the best books about the financial crisis in Japan. Yeah, always a good sign. Um, yeah, so Ray, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, yeah, for you personally and Kenichi Valley, what are the plans from here? Like, what are you curious about going forward? What can we expect? Give me, give me some insight. Oh, all right, right. Yeah, I heard you heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, um, well, yesterday I released uh, uh, a new article about the lost generation, right? I talked a little bit about today, um, which you can always find on konnichivalue.com. Uh, and I also uh, made a video on YouTube for it. Uh, so also konnichivalue on YouTube, uh, um, which you should definitely check out. Uh, I think, you know, YouTube is a very interesting media and I really want to explore it more. And so please, if anybody sees it, just give me feedback because I'm very new to YouTube and cutting videos, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, You know, you see these like 20 minute documentaries or whatever on YouTube and you're like, wow, this is great. I should do it myself. And when you do it, you're just like, this is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I cannot stress uh, this enough. But, yeah. but still, it's fun. Hmm. Uh, also, I, I lastly want to say, um, actually, I'm working on, on quite a big project now, too, about the uh, Sogo Shoshas. So that's the Japanese trading companies, you know, like companies like Mitsubishi or Itochu or, you know, there's, there's tons of them. Mitsui is someone that's really big or Marubeni. And I'm, I'm trying to write an a, a article about the history of them because it's super interesting. You know, they were basically the reason why the Japanese economy is the way it is. And they were there from the beginning, from the 1800s, when mm. Japan opened up and, and became the country of today, both pre and post war Japan. And so I think that's that's the biggest thing I'm working on now. But mm. as always, I'm, I'm releasing articles two times a week, I try. So, uh, you know, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, you're prolific. I love it. I love your work. And yeah, the trading house is very much looking forward to. So, um, yeah, Ray, thank you so much. Anything else where people can find you? Anything you want to add? But yeah, cheers a million for coming on. Oh, well, you know, I'm I'm always on Twitter um, <laughs> with a weird handle, <laughs> Miso Soup. Uh, it's spelled in a Swedish way, so you have to you have to work a little bit to yeah. find me there. And uh, other than that, you know, you can just mail me at ray at uh, I tend to answer all my emails. Um, and a lot of people are asking for a specific corporate analysis. <laughs> <laughs> Which I am. I mean, I like to, but it, those do take uh, many days. So mm. I, I don't think I can fulfill all of them. Yeah, no, fair enough. It's always nice to hear ideas, but sometimes there's too many out there to take advantage of. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's hard work. It's mm. really hard work to create content. Yeah, oh, well. but yeah, right. Thank you so much for coming on. I've had a yeah, absolutely yeah, blast. Thank though. you. So cool. Yeah, me too. Always a pleasure being with you. Thank you. Too kind. <laughs>